In contrast to our physical, human, fleshly bodies, I want to today give you a little bit of insight of how our bodies will be changed and how they will fit for the celestial spheres. As you know, human beings cannot get off this earth because of gravity and because us being confined to this soil from which we came. And it's interesting to know that when you die, you go back to the same soil which you come out of. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a glimpse into the celestial spheres today. It's called Man's Celestial Mission, and it's out of a whole study called The Mission of Mankind. Now, it was written in excerpts in The Unsearchable Riches, but you can actually find the whole article online at concordant.org, or probably you can find that at the uh, Herald of God's Grace as well. Good morning. Rob here. It's Friday. Ooh. I'm in my garage still. I haven't left my garage, no. I went in the house to cook supper and, uh, you know, clean house and do them things. I wasn't sitting here since yesterday morning. But it feels like it sometimes. Anyway, Man's Celestial Mission. I'm only going to read so much of this today because it's quite a big article. So you'll have to bear with my reading and uh, hopefully you'll get something out of it. Um, like I said, I'm not the greatest reader, but uh, I'm getting better at it. And I hope you can uh, clearly hear me and uh, understand what I'm trying to say here. A serious difficulty arises in reference to man's mission to the celestials. His present body is not at all capable of carrying it out. It is not adapted to any environment except the surface of the earth. When the Corinthians doubted the resurrections, this seems to have been the chief stumbling block. How are the dead being roused, and with what body are they coming? 1 Corinthians 15.35 For Israel there is no need of much change except immunity from death. For the celestial saints, this is not enough. With a body of flesh and blood, they would suffer intensely from a celestial environment. Those who talk ghibli, glibly about going to heaven should not think only of the golden harps, but of the possible pain and distress which is the lot of human beings who ascend to the great height above their normal surroundings in the lower regions of the earth. It's funny, golden harps, yeah, that's what we do when we go to heaven. We sit on clouds and play golden harps, and that's what we do all day. There's nothing else to do. See, this is according to Christendom. Christendom. I liked what a brother said on Facebook. Christendom. And that's what they are. They're dumb. Okay. In meeting this question, the apostle appeals to the facts of nature. He points to, the, to three distinct spheres. The plants, the animals, and the heavenly bodies and draws a different lesson from each. He calls attention to the seeds of, of plants, the flesh of man and beasts and flyers and fishes, and to the bodies of celestial beings. The terrestrial bodies differ from the glory of that of the celestial. These have many degrees of glory, also shown in the sun, the moon, and the stars. This is, for, this is further elaborated and applied to the resurrection. And the marvelous change which will transform our corrupt, dishonorable, infirm, soulish, soilish frames into incorruptible, glorious, powerful, spiritual, celestial bodies, fit for our high mission among the celestial hosts. Three distinct, three distinct fa phases of our return from death to life are presented in the scriptures. Each of, the, each of which is associated with a different feature of man's constitution. Resurrection is related especially to the body, rousing to the soul, and vivification to the spirit. Of course, they are so closely involved with one another that one usually implies the rest, the rest of them. Yet it seems that in explaining how vivification proceeds, 
we are pointed to seeds rousing to flesh, while resurrection is explained by means of celestial bodies. The vegetable, the animal, and the mi mineral kingdom are called upon to explain the change in spirit, soul, and body respectively. Vivification by death. The oldest life forms on the earth's surface, so far as I am aware, are plants. I once saw a tree in, in the high Sierras of California, which is perhaps the largest form of life known to man. So far as I could determine, it dates back as far as the deluge, about 4,000 years. Plants come much nearer to incorruptibility and immortality than animals, but this is not to be, illustration, to be the illustration used to explain the resurrection. This tree had had no need of vivification, for it has never died. It is so vast in its proportions that it contains enough lumber to build a whole village. All life, even that of plants, is due to spirit and can only spring from spirit. But the mode of transmission to most plants differs from that in animals. In the latter, the seed gradually develops into a new individual. In the grains, the kernel does not bring forth another kernel, but produces the whole, a whole plant with foliage and flowers and much more wonderful in form and appearance than itself. The point here seems to be that the vitality, the, that the vitality, the spirit of the seed is transmitted to a habitation quite different from that which it left, even if it is the same spirit. The great change is in the two bodies that one spirit receives. A grain remains a grain until its form perishes. If its outward form does not decay and die, the plant does not spring up. The usual translation, that, wi that which thou sowest, is not quickened except it die. This seems to suggest that only dead seed can produce a new crop. But quite the opposite is true. Dead seed will only decay. It will, it will bring forth nothing. It should read, What you are sowing is not vivifying if it should not be dying. This, that is, the dying not dead seed imparts its life to the new plant. In the process of doing this, it must give up its own life. It loses its form and what is left of it decays. There is no return from death as with us. We are not pointed to plants as examples of vivification such as we will experience at the presence of Christ. Seeds are simply illustrations of how the same spirit may be clothed with a body far more marvelous than the one which has decayed. The comparison between the seeds of, of plants and ourselves is not immediately enforced, but is, to, is, but is delayed a few lines in which the flesh of animals on earth and the bodies of celestial spheres are also introduced. In order to cover the soul and body as well as the spirit which we have just discussed. That the seeds are once more the subject is evident from the resumption of the figure of sowing. Terrestrial flesh and celestial bodies are not sown. So long as this picture is used we may be sure that the comparison is between the seed and the plant which springs from it and stresses the spirit. Yet this is also linked to the next comparison, which concerns the soul because our soulish bodies will be roused a spiritual body. It is important to remember that although spirit and soul are often in view in this discussion, the dominating theme, theme is the resurrection body. As the seed in the soil goes to corruption, so it is with our mortal bodies. There are so, they are so, to speak, planted in the soil and are returning to it. While the seed is left to decay in the earth, the plant is thrusting its blade above the ground. Its stalk is shooting upward. Its foliage is spreading abroad. Its flowers are scenting the air. What a contrast. So it is with the bodies which, which our spirits now inhabit. Compared, compared with that which, which shall be. Like the seed sown in the soil, our mortal frames are dying disintegrating, returning to the soil until the spirit leaves and returns to God who gave it. But the same spirit, like the vital force of the plant, will vivify a body which will never die, which, which the least tinge of corruption will never touch. 
What a relief, what a joy. How unutterably thankful we will be. What Our adoration of God will no longer be handicapped by a corrupting corpse, but rather that by gone experience will enable us to enjoy it to the full and respond to the grace of which it is an expression. Okay, so that's where I'm going to stop. Monday, I will continue on with this. It's called The Body That Shall Be, and it'll explain our body celestial, what we will receive at the resurrection, what we will receive literally at the snatching away. So understand, this mortal body is not going to last much longer. Consider this, we only live 50 to 100 years on this earth in this mortal flesh. It is but a blink, but a little spark, and that's it. It's like a seed sown. And we will receive our celestial frame at the snatching away when we meet Christ in the air. And that should be the wonderful expectation that we have. We will no longer suffer in these bodies of humiliation. And that is a wonderful, wonderful truth. And if you can tell somebody that, they will have no fear of death, understanding that death is producing life. Okay, so with that happy note, I will say grace and peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, we will see you Monday, folks, and have a great weekend in the Lord.